So we discussed in the last few chapters, from chapter 35 to chapter 40, we discussed the difference and the relationship between the act of the mitzvah, what we call the action, and the kavana, which was the intention. And we said that the kavana, the intention, is secondary. The primary purpose of the mitzvah is the action, because the action is, is what we, how we fulfill the purpose of creation, which is to create a home for God in this world. And then we said, yes, but don't forget about intention. And in chapter 38, in chapter 38, uh, 39, and 40, we discussed how intention actually brings the energy and the awareness into the action. And the metaphor was you can have a home for God, and you have, you have shelter, and, the, and God is present in that home. But then the question is, are you going to have a home that is also imbued with, um, <clears throat> are you going to have a home that's imbued with uh, beauty and design and appreciating God's presence? And that happens when we do the mitzvah with kavana, with intention. So that was the last few chapters, last six chapters. From chapter 40 until chapter 50, we're going to talk about the intention. And again, intention is, um, as discussed here, intention really means the motivation. What's the motivation to do the mitzvah? And the motivation is the love and the awe. Those are the primary two emotions. And over the next few chapters, we're going to have various um, meditations of how to awaken the emotions that are supposed to drive and fuel the commitment and the, of, of connect, connecting to God through fulfilling the Torah, studying the Torah, and fulfilling the commands. So that's just to give us an uh, overview of what's happening here. Um, we're going to go back in chapter 40. We're going to go back to the metaphor that we said last week, which is that a bird needs two wings to soar. A bird cannot soar with one wing alone. And what that what we take that to mean that you need both love as well as awe. One is not enough, you need both. And <clears throat> you need both. And that's what this chapter is going to be about. It's going to give you start with meditation. We're going to have some meditation for love and some meditation for awe. We're going to continue on that theme in the next few chapters. We have a few chapters. We, we're going to talk, talk about the various levels of love and various levels of awe. But now we're sort of laying, laying the groundwork. We're laying the groundwork. <clears throat> So the first question, I don't want to say question, the first issue we're going to address is between the love of God and the awe of God, which we already mentioned last week, and we're going to continue about it this week. They are both the two wings you need for the relationship. So a relationship requires two wings to soar, just like a bird needs two wings. You cannot imagine <clears throat> a bird can fly with one wing. So the relationship with God cannot <clears throat> be uh, the, the emotions behind the relationship with God are not fully mature until you have both sides, both the love and the awe, which we can refer to as awe. You can call it respect. You can call it fear. Call it whatever whatever you want. In Hebrew, it's one word, yira. The question becomes, which one to start with? Which one is primary? Would you say love or would you say respect? Now, Rabbi Shneir Zaman starts the chapter by saying at the beginning, the most primary, um, the, the beginning, the beginning of the service of God and the foundation of the service of God, a person should start with the awe, with respect, and only then move to love. That's the statement. Now, we ought to figure out why that is. So one interpretation Rabbi Shneir Zalman says in the chapter is that our relationship with God is service. And ultimately, service is about the other person. It's not about me. If it's about me, it's not service. I'm doing what, I, if I go with you and I do what you want, but I want to do it as well, it's not service. Service, the idea of serving God means doing something for the other person. And you talk about love, we always talk about this, ultimately love at the foundation of love is self-love. At the ult Ultimately, the foundation of love is, um, I want to be drawn, I, I want to be close to you. So ultimately, it's about myself. Um, sometimes people are in love with somebody else. Um, even though they know for the other person, this love may not be healthy. But because for me, that's what I want, I'm going to pursue it, right? As opposed to awe, respect is about the other person. 
I may want to come close to you, but you may not want it, and you may not want it in this moment, and you may not want it in this way. So I retreat, give you space. That's what the awe, that's what respect is. I recognize the other person, put the other person before myself. So that's the love and the awe. So Rabbi Shneur Zalman says, look, if you're going to serve God, the foundation of the service of God would have to be, would have to be awe, would have to be respect, would have to be service. But then there's another interpretation that he has, he doesn't, that, that Tanya doesn't say explicitly, but I, I, I heard this interesting interpretation that goes like this. The opening statement is the beginning of the service and its foundation. And what we're going to say is that the foundation of love is respect. In other words, if you have just respect, you have respect. But if you have just love, there is no such thing as just love. In other words, love must be predicated on respect. Just love, you, there's no such thing as just love. Where, where, where would you see that? What's the metaphor? And this metaphor resonates with me. Tell me if it resonates with you as well. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Again, it's not written clearly in the Tanya, but uh, I think this rings true. So the metaphor, the metaphor would be a person, a guy comes home late, four hours late. His wife is waiting for him. He didn't call. He didn't text. He didn't send an email. He didn't give any indication that he's coming late. But he comes home four hours late. But he's so in love with his wife that he comes home with a bouquet of roses. And he's so happy because, look, I'm going to express my love to my wife. I'm going to give her roses. Now, from the wife's perspective, she cannot appreciate this love. She's not happy that he came home with the roses because to have love, you have to have the premise and the foundation of respect. If you don't respect me to the point that you're not even going to tell me that, what, that you're coming late, so I cannot receive your love. So perhaps this is what Rabbi Shneur Zalman is saying. The shorish, the ikar, the foundation of love is also respect. So the reason why you have to have respect first or awe first is first of all, because we're serving God. And if you want it to be service, you need to have put the other person first. That's the definition of awe as opposed to the definition of love, which is about me coming close to the person I want to become close to. So that is a wonderful thing. So, 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 so in other words, this, the starting point is one point is that love, that awe has to come first. Respect has to come first because we're talking about service. And there's a mitzvah to serve God. So it means put God first. So that's awe first. But then there's another point, which is if you don't have the love, I'm sorry, the second point is if you don't have the respect, then you don't have the love. The love can only work if there's respect. So that's the introdu that's introduction number one. We're going to spend some time thinking about the meditation of awe, of respect, different degrees. Then we're going to go to love. And then in love, we're going to talk about what a person really wants when, it, when, it, when he wants to connect to God. And just to be brief, Rabbi Shnez now differentiates between what I want and what God wants. What I want, my soul, if I can reveal my love to God, my soul wants to become close to God. What God wants, it's much more general than that. When he talks about love, I want to come close to God. That's my motivation. Which means when I do a mitzvah, I want to unite my soul with God. Okay. But what we're saying here, Kabbalistically, what God really wants is to unite, to unite my soul with all, to unite God with the collective souls of Israel. In other words, because we're all interconnected, then when I do a mitzvah, I'm not just connecting the, I'm not just bringing down additional light from Hashem or energy from Hashem to myself, but I'm a part of the Jewish people. So I'm really connecting God to the collective Jewish people. And that's a Kabbalistic idea that we, Chabad, we say it in the morning once a day before we pray. We say the Shemichu for the sake of the unity of the divine presence of, a, of God, of the Holy One, blessed be, he, blessed be He, and His divine presence, which means divine presence is collective Jewish people, collective souls. Um, but other people say it before every mitzvah. So here Rabbi Shneir Zalman says, we're going to differentiate that when it comes to what um, I want to unite with God, that is something that every soul wants naturally. The broader idea that I want to, con I want to connect, I want God to connect to the collective souls of Israel, that you have to be on a little bit of a higher level and you don't always feel that love and he gets into that. But the bottom line takeaway is you have to start with respect. You can't end with respect because, again, we're going to keep going back to the metaphor. You need the two wings, and the two wings are both the awe and the love, 
And only then could the uh, bird soar. Only then could the relationship, um, could the relationship be a, whole, a wholesome one. So that's the introduction with the break, 19 minutes. You had a break also. So that's the introduction. So if any comments or questions, please share. Otherwise, we're going to go straight to the Tanya. It is a very long chapter, but it is not very difficult in the sense that it's not very Kabbalistic. It's very straightforward. So I think we'll be able to read the entire chapter before 11, God willing, in good health. Go ahead, Bob, please. Uh, just a, a quick question. You know, on the basis of Na'asev and Ishma, uh, one is a kind of a, a more passive thing and one is an active thing. And and we are learned from that parable that we should almost in a reflexive way do the active thing first and then sit back and reflect. So right. when given the choice of love and awe, I would have said probably on that basis, love is a much more active thing to do is to that God would love us to love him first. And then as we mature and sit back, the awe uh, develops. All right. So I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. And it's definitely true that love is active and awe is passive. It's about not giving you space. It's not coming in and, and, and superimposing myself, not doing what I want, doing what you want. And it's true because earlier in the Tanya in chapter four, the author Rebbe says, Rebbe Shnei Zalman says that, that uh, love is the motivator for all positive mitzvot and awe is the motivator for the negative mitzvot. In other words, what awe says, I'm not going to do what I want. I would rather eat a, I, I would rather go and sin, but I'm not going to do the awe. I'm not going to do it because of the awe of God. So you're right that in some sense that they write that, that love is active and awe is passive. However, when it comes to Nasev and Ishma, I would say it a little bit different. I would say that to do something that I don't understand right, is negating the self. To understand, to learn and listen and understand why you're doing it, now I could be in love with it. So from one perspective, Nasev and Ishma, yes, if you look at active and passive, you could say yeah, it's active first and then reflect. But I would think of it as do something, even if you don't understand why you're doing it. That's not an expansion of self. That's not love. That's, that, is a, um, that, that, that is a suspension of self. I don't understand why I'm doing it, but I'm doing it for you. So you could say I'm motivated by love, but it's much more likely to say, but, but it could be understood to be uh, motivated by awe. So I would say that the submission, Nasev and Ishma is an act of submission, and submission comes from awe, right? Somebody said like this, Rabbi Steinsatz wrote this. Let me just see if I can remember what he said. He said, some people, they love you so much, so they're going to go beyond what you want, but they're not going to do it the way you want it. In other words, that's because they're in love. So they're going to do what they want. What, what they want, they'll do a lot for you, but it's what they want. Then there are other people that are not going to go beyond, but they'll do exactly what you want. That's more of awe because it's not about them. So in other words, one way, so in other words my, my point is that you could be active out of awe, but, but active out of awe means that I'm not doing it as an expansion of self. I'm actually doing it as a suspension of self. And that's Nasef and Nishma. Before I have the Nishma, before I comprehend, before I appreciate intellectually what I'm doing, if I'm doing it, if I'm doing it for you, then it's about, then it's about, um, that if I'm doing it for you, then it's about suspension of self and we would put it in the column of awe. So that's, that's one way to look at it. Go ahead, Karina, please. Yes, hey, hello. Um, can we relate this with the Ten Commandments? when it says like that you have to respect your parents, it doesn't say that you have to love your parents, but you have to respect right, them. Right, right. Let's talk about the parents for a moment. There are two commandments in the Torah. The Ten Commandments says honor. honor. Now it doesn't okay. say respect, it says honor. But then there's another verse in the book of Leviticus that says uh, tira, fear, or be in awe, or respect. And just like Bob said, there's, pass there's passive and active. And in the Ten Commandments, honor, honor your parents is active. It's this is what you have to do for them. And there's a whole list of, 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 of examples in the Talmud of things that you have to do to honor your parents. But that's active. Then when it says be in awe of your parents, that's passive. Talmud also says don't sit in their place. You know, don't interrupt, don't, don't, inter don't, don't interrupt them out of speaking, etc. So that division of, of, of uh, of honor doesn't say you have to love, but but it says you have to honor. But that division of passive and active is also with the relationship with parents. Correct. So thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, like I said, it's not a it's not a short chapter, but it's not difficult in the sense it's not difficult to understand what he's saying. I'm not going to say it's not difficult to do, but it's not difficult to understand what he's saying. At least in relation, to, at least after the the more Kabbalistic chapters that we had earlier. This may be the longest chapter, either this week or next week is the longest chapter. Okay, here we go. One must, however, in other words, we're starting 41. After ha having said all that, having said that we need both wings, now that we say one must, however, constantly bear in mind what is the beginning of divine service as well as its core and root. So we have the beginning, core, and root. Um, that this means, although fear is the root of turn away from evil, meaning from an awe, I'm not going to go, go, go against God's will, so that's being passive, and love is the root to do good. So you would think just, just be in love, just do good. Isn't that enough? Nevertheless, it is not sufficient to awaken the love alone to do good. But at the very least, before performing the positive commandment, positive command, one must first arouse the innate fear, which lies hidden in the heart of every Jew, not to rebel against the Supreme King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be he, as has been stated above. I'm just going to give a qualification when he says fear. You could just say the word fear. You could say the word awe. You could say that word respect, whatever works for you. But in other words, innately, a Jewish soul doesn't want to go against God's will, as we mentioned earlier in chapter 19. Now, you have this, yeah, you have this innate will, but it has to be in your conscious mind so that this fear should manifest itself in his heart or at least in his mind. What does that mean? So what should I meditate about? This means that in order to arouse within himself the latter category of fear, meaning at least in your, in your awareness, he should at least contemplate in his mind the greatness of the blessed in himself and his kingship. In other words, you have to start with thinking about the greatness of God, which extends to all worlds, both higher and lo lower. And he fills the worlds and encompasses the worlds. Fills the words means that, that he animates the worlds, encompasses, encompasses the world, encompasses the worlds means he transcends the world. As it is written, do I not fill heaven and earth? Yet, he leaves, meaning God, he, God, leaves aside the creatures of the higher worlds and the creatures of the lower worlds. He uniquely bestows kingship upon his people of Israel in general and upon him in particular. For a man is obligated to say, for my sake was the world created. This is a Talmudic statement. Every person has to say, the world was created for me. Does that mean we, does that mean we all have to be narcissistic? Narcissistic to think the entire world was created for me? In some sense, yes. In other words, our relationship with God, it's not that God has a desire wants to be served by the collective humanity or even the collective Jewish people. No, God, who is transcends, who creates the entire universe and transcends this entire universe. And we know about the size of the universe. We're, we're, the, the, this, 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 the whole solar system is not even a speck of dust compared to the vastness of the universe. God transcends all of that. Yet God wants a relationship with the individual. All right. He be bestows his kingship on the Jewish people in general, but on, upon the individual individually. So when you say the world was created for me, what it means is that God wants an individual relationship with each person as a result. And he, for, for his part, accepts his kingship upon himself, that be king over him to serve him and to do his will in all kinds of servile work. And behold, God himself stands over him and the whole world and, um, and the whole world is full only with his glory. And not only being omnipresent does he see everything, but, we, but moreover, he scrutinizes him in particular and searches his reins and, and, and heart, and heart i.e. the innermost thoughts and emotions, to see if he is serving him as is fitting. Therefore, he must serve in his presence with awe and fear, like one standing before a king. One must meditate profoundly and at length on this concept, according to the capacity of apprehension of his brain and thought and the time available. How much time should I think about this? Depending on how much time you have. Before he engages in Torah, in the study of Torah, or before performance of a commandment, such as before putting on his talis or tefillin. So what Rabbi Shneur Zaman is describing that in the morning, before you start praying, you take a moment to two moments, depending on how much time you have, and you think about the greatness of God, how Hashem transcends the universe, first of all, creates the universe. Every aspect, every, every aspect of this universe is an expression of God's greatness. That's called Malik Kalami. That's called the light of God. That, that is imminent within the world, that creates the world. And then you say this entire world, God transcends this entire world. The metaphor we had earlier in Tanya is that the entire universe is like one ray of sun compared to the, to the, to the complete body of the sun, which is completely insignificant. And yet this being, God, who fills the world and transcends the world, wants a relationship with me, and he stands here to see whether I'm going to serve him or not. And then I put on my talus and fill in, which means I understand that there's something greater than me here, and I'm serving something greater than self. And that's what he calls the awe. That's the basic awe that anybody could achieve.
And later he's going to say, if you can't even achieve this thought, if even if this level of awe is too abstract for you, we have even a more basic level of awe. Now we get into um, specifics, that the infinite light of God is present even more when I do a specific mitzvah. And he talks about different mitzvot, the specific meditation for specific mitzvot. So we're going to get a little Kabbalistic, but we'll, I think we'll make it through. He should also reflect how the light of the blessed Ain Sof, the infinite light, which encompasses all the worlds and pervades all worlds, and which is identical with the higher, identical with the higher will. In other words, or Sof, the infinite light, is, the, is God's will. Is clothed in the letters and wisdom of Torah, or in these tzitzit and tefillin, in being, in being God's will that a Jew wears in. And through his recitation of study or, or study of the Torah, or by his wearing the tzitzit and tefillin, he draws upon himself his blessed life that is over the part of God above his soul, which abides in his body and animates it. This he does with the intent that he may be absorbed and nullified in his blessed light. In other words, it's not just that Hashem is in general present, but when I'm doing the mitzvah, I'm bringing God's infinite light upon me, and I want to be completely subsumed within the light of God. And then he gets into, into specifics, which light of God is drawn down through which mitzvah, and he's basically going to say that tefillin represents the tense, the, the intellectual spirit. Tefillin has four chambers, four portions of the Torah. Two of them represent Chachma, two of them represent Bina. And then he talks about the idea that tzitzit, talit, because it encompasses me, represents the infinite light that surrounds me. It's above my head. It's not above my capacity to comprehend. But in any case, the additional idea here is that when I'm doing a mitzvah, specifically when I'm doing a mitzvah, I should be in awe of the presence of God because what the mitzvah does is it brings the presence of God upon me and unites me with the presence of God. So the awe and the awareness of the awe has to be heightened, uh, heightened when I do the mitzvah. Specifically, through the film we shall intend that the attributes of wisdom and understanding which are in and his divine soul shall be nullified and absorbed into the attributes of wisdom and understanding of the blessed and self, these being clothed in particular in the passages of Kadesh and Vahaya Kiyacha, which is Chachma and Bina. In other words, when I put on my tefillin, I'm connecting my wisdom and understanding my intellectual attributes with, with God's intellectual attributes. Because Kabbalistically, Kadesh is Chachma and, and, and the next chapter is Bina. And what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to connect my intellectual attributes to, to the divine intellectual attributes, which means that is to say they should use his wisdom and understanding that are in his soul for God alone. Similarly, he should intend that the attribute of Da'at in his soul, which includes both the Chesed and Gehura, I fear and love in his heart, um, be nullified and absorbed into the attribute of, high, of higher knowledge, Dat Elyon, which comprises kindness and severity, and which is clothed in the passage of Shema and Vahaya Im Shemaya. This accords with the statement of the Shulchan Aruch, the Court of Law, which is going to say the same thing, but without the Kabbalistic uh, lingo, that while putting on tefillin, one should intend to make one's heart and brain subservient to God. That's what it says in the, in the Code of Law. The Code of Law says, before I put on my tefillin, I should think that I'm dedicating my heart and my mind to God. The language of the Kabbalah, the tefillin have four chambers. Two represent chachma and bina, wisdom, and understanding, which is intellectual. And then the third, and then there's two more portions. Is dat is the knowledge which branches out to love and awe. In any case, and then we get to tzitzit to sum, sum this all up. And while putting on tzitzit, one should bear in mind that is that what is written in the Zohar, namely that he should draw upon himself the blessed kingdom, which is the kingdom over all worlds, meaning it's encompassing light, just like the mitzvah surrounds the entire body unlike the tefillin, which represent the intellectual um, and emotional attributes. In any case, um, this is similar to the commandment, you shall surely set a king over yourself. I put the palace over me. I'm, I'm sort of accepting upon myself the kingship of God. Now, what, what have we just said? Basically, what we said before I start doing a mitzvah, I want to be aware of the presence of God. I have to meditate as much as, for as much as, as to the extent that I have the intellectual power to do so. And to the extent that I have the time to do so, I have to think about the uh, one is uh, how God is 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 trans fills the world, transcends the worlds, and yet He wants a relationship with me. Specifically, when I'm doing mitzvah, because I'm doing when I'm doing a mitzvah, every mitzvah does it a little differently. It's bringing down the so one aspect of the infinite light and connecting it to me. So I have to heighten my awareness of the presence of God and awe and respect to God. I'm here to serve Him. I'm not just doing it because it makes me feel good, even though it does. That's going to be love. That will be the next half of the chapter. Now we continue and we say, even if a person does not feel intense love, intense awe, it's still considered serving God. And we're basically now going to make it even more accessible to everybody. Even this is difficult to achieve, but we're going to make it more accessible. So here we go. 
Because remember, Rabbi Shneir Zaman understands that he has to speak to the average person, to the common person, not just to the people who are spiritually sensitive. And here we go. In such a case, having contemplated this matter, then even though after all this meditation, no dread or fear descends upon him in a manifest manner in his heart, it's not like he feels the emotion, intense emotion of respect and awe of God. Nevertheless, since he accepts the kingdom of heaven upon himself and draws upon himself the fear of him in his conscious thought and rational volition, and this submission to God and uh, to God and his fear of him is beyond doubt a sincere one, for it is the nature of all Jewish souls not to rebel against the blessed holy king. Then the Torah he studies or the commandments he performs because of his submission and because of the fear that he has drawn into his mind and termed complete, is termed complete service, like all service performed by a servant for his master or king. Rabbi Shneur is saying, look, even if you don't feel the emotion of the heart, is it fine? As long as in your mind you have the awareness that you're doing this because you want to accept God's kingship. You want to accept God's will. That is considered, you are considered now serving. And because you're serving, that's considered awe. And it's also considered the foundation of love, which we'll talk later, because again, love without awe, is, it, it doesn't work. You have to have the foundation of, of, of respect and honor. Now, on the other hand, if one studied Torah and performed the commandment with love alone, in order to cleave to him through the study of his Torah and the performance of his commandments. In other words, I come, why, do I, why am I studying Torah? Not because I'm in awe of God, not because I wanted to do God's will, because I love it. I wanted to come close to God. It's all motivated by love. Says Rabbi Shneir Zalman, the problem would be, going back to the Zohar's metaphor, you only have one wing. So you got, he says as follows. He says, um, then this is not termed service, a servant. Whereas the Torah was declared, you shall serve, the Lord your God. You have to serve God, not just be a different mitzvah, to be in love with God, but this mitzvah to serve God. And serve means put the other person first, uh, submit to the will of God. Him shall you serve. As explained in the Zohar, Parshat Bahar, just like an ox, on which one first, is pla on one first, pl first places a yoke in order to make it useful to the world, so too must the human being first of all submit to the yoke of the kingdom of heaven, and only then engage in divine service, and if this submission is not found in him, holiness cannot rest within him. In other words, you have to start with the awe and only then the submission, and only then you can get to the love. And now we're going to quote another place in the Zohar that says, and in Raya Mahanad it is written that every man must be in his divine service belong to two categories and levels, namely the category of a servant and the category of a son. So the servant operates through, through awe and fear. The son operates out of love. Now we're going to get into a concept, although one may find it, a son who is also a servant. In other words, somebody can experience both emotions together. A son could also have respect, and therefore you're a son that's, that's a servant as well. He's going to say, we can't get to that level until you get to the higher levels of law, which we'll discuss later. It is, it is, imp it is impossible to attain to this degree without the prerequisite of the higher level of fear and awe, known as Yirei Law, as is known to the initiated. We'll talk about that later. In other words, what are we saying? We're saying that Yes, you can get to a step where you're going to have the love and awe simultaneously, but not yet. Right now, you have to start with the level of submission, with the level of acceptance, of, of appreciating God's presence, and therefore honoring God's presence. And I'm doing the mitzvah because it's God's will, not because I want to become close to God. That we'll get to later. That's the love that's going to be in the second and later in the chapter. Okay. And we said, even if you don't feel the awe in your heart, it doesn't matter. It's in your consciousness. It's enough. Now we're going to make it even more accessible. We're going to say, what happens if even that level of consciousness, somebody doesn't, doesn't, doesn't feel, feel the awe? I meditate, I don't feel the awe. Why? Because my soul is not, is not sensitive to these types of things. So we're going to actually make it even more accessible. And we're going to predicate this with a beautiful story. Talmud says like this, a very practical story. The sages were very practical people. So there's a, one of the greatest say, Talmudic sages, Rabbi Yechanan ben Zakkai, who was the leader of the Jewish people in the second temple, when the second temple was destroyed. And they're fascinating stories with him in the Talmud, how he saved, he, he tried to, he tried to, to, to he saved, he tried to save Jerusalem. He wasn't able to. He was able to save, uh, to spear the city of Yavne. He got the Romans to spear the city of Torah scholarship. And that's basically how he saved the Jewish people because the center of scholarship was preserved even though the temple was destroyed. In any case, uh, the Talmud talks about Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai when he's passing. When he's passing, his students came to speak to him and they had interesting conversations without getting into the, all those details. That's in Tracti Brachot. That's another, for another time. But what's relevant to us is he told his students, I give you a blessing. What's the blessing? He said, you should fear God the way you fear another person. But they were offended. Fear God? You should fear God much more than you fear another person. What do you mean? So Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai said, when a person sins, what does he say? He says, I hope nobody sees me. I hope another person doesn't see me. If you have that level of awe, you're good to go. 
In other words, what, what Rabbi Shneir Zaman is going to use that in saying, even if you don't feel the awe, but if you're thinking about God and you're conscious of his presence, that's also considered awe. Look at the Talmudic story. Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai said, that's considered fear. So even if you don't feel the fear, but you feel the divine presence here, so, so, so that's already considered fear. You're not going to go against God's will. That's considered enough awe and fear to be able to be considered a wing to serve God and to be able to, 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 be, to consider your, you as a servant of God, not just someone who loves God, which love is wonderful, but it has to come later. It's only one wing. Okay, so here we go. Let's continue with this inside. Hine, furthermore, even in the case of an individual who even in his mind and thought feels no fear or shame, on account of the limited grade of his soul originating in the lower degrees of the 10th sphere of Asiya. Kabbalistically speaking, the 10th sphere, every soul is rooted in one of the 10th sphere. So even though every soul has all 10 intellectual uh, uh, sphere, uh, uh, um, spiritual sphere, all 10 soul powers, but some people are just more action oriented than intellectually oriented. So some people will not respond to this meditation in the same way. Nevertheless, since he is intent, his intent, he is intent in his service to serve the king. This is unequivocally a complete service. For fear and service are accounted as two commandments of the total of 613, and they do not exclude each other. In other words, even if you insist that I don't feel, feel any fear at all, doesn't matter, you're serving God. It's service. Service is different than fear. And now we're going to say the truth is it's also fear. Furthermore, as a matter of fact, he, is also fulfills, he also fulfills the commandment of fearing God by introducing the fear into his thoughts. For at this hour and moment, at any rate, there rests upon him the fear of heaven, at least like one's fear in the presence of an ordinary mortal, even not a king who is watching him, when he would refrain from doing anything unseemly in the other's eyes. This, even the simple expression of fear, is termed fear, as Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said to his disciples, may it be God's will that the fear of heaven be upon you like the fear of a human being. He responded, so they, they were upset, whereupon his disciples protested, no more than this, he responded that the proof that this is indeed a true form of fear is as follows, for you know that when a person commits a sin, he says to himself, may no one see me. In other words, if you have God in your presence, if you have God in your thought and mind, at least like another person is here, that's still, con that's still considered the awe. He's going to say it's a lower level of awe, but it's awe as nonetheless. Such fear, however, is termed yirat tata, the lower level, and yirat chet, fear of sin, which precedes, precedes wisdom. While the higher fear is shameful, sh shame-faced fear, i.e. the state of being ashamed and of over overawed in God's presence, but we're going to talk about that later. For there are two kinds of fear, which we'll talk later in the later chapters. Without any fear at all, however, i.e. once fulfillment of Torah mitzvah does not soar on high to the supernal sphere through love alone, just as a bird cannot fly with one wing, for fear and love are two wings, as stated in Tikkun Zohar, as we mentioned in the previous chapters. Okay, wonderful. That's awe. If anyone has questions on awe, please put them forth right now because we're moving now to love. So to summarize, the foundation of everything has to be awe. And awe in this context means think about the presence of the greatness of God, how every aspect of this universe is an expression of his light that is imminent within the world. So by, as Maimonides says, by seeing the beauty of this world, you think about, you see the greatness of God. Then you think about the idea that this entire universe he transcends this entire universe. He encompasses this entire universe because the entire universe is only a ray. Then you think about that fact that God wants a relationship with me. He's present here. He wants to be. He wants me to do what He wants. Okay. So either I'm in awe if I'm if I'm if I if my if my emotions will respond to that idea and I and I meditate properly over time, I'll, I'll be in awe. Even if I'm not in awe, at least I'm, I, I at least I am aware of the presence of God and. At a minimum, it would be like somebody else is watching me and I'm serving God. In other words, I'm doing this not because I want it. I'm doing it because he wants it, because that's what awe is as opposed to love. And then we're going to say, now I have my one wing. Once I have respect, now I can go to love. As I mentioned earlier, that love without respect is not love. Love without respect is just about myself. And it could be harmful. It could be, it could be offensive, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Thank you, Rabbi. I think you just answered my question, but I thought I missed something because with the tefillin example, it says that it's better not to have any emotion at all than to have just love, to do it out of love, right? Which is better do yeah. it with you no have emotion. To do it right? The action you have to do regardless. Action you have to do regardless, that's God's will. The question is, what is my awareness? And my awareness is, my awareness is um, love and awe. But what we're saying is, if you're in love and there's no foundation of that awe, it's not even love. It's just about self. It's worship. It's self-worship. 
You can have love that is self that is self worship, and you can have love that is bringing you close to somebody else, and it's a positive thing. What's the difference? If there's some um, um, respect at the foundation, then it's going to be a healthy love. If not, it's just self 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 worship. But but then another question is when the when God, uh, God created the world, the primary emotion was love. So is it because the the creations function function differently? I don't know that. I don't know that the primary emotion was love. That you're right that the primary emotion was love of the spherot. The first act of, of creation is an act of, in some sense, the first act is expression. Chesed Sunday was light, and light is love, and chesed is love. But before that, there had to be a symptom. Before God can even create anything, the first step is to remove and, and make space for the creation, to create that, that symptom, the hollow, the empty space where the presence of God is not felt. Simsum is an act of awe. It's an act of respect. It's an act of God respecting us, giving space for our perspective. So it all depends where you want to start your story. You could say creation starts with the act of giving, correct? But before there could be an act of giving, there has to be an act of holding back everything else. So for example, you want to go and you want to teach your, 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 your child something, but you're, 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 you, you know much more. Before you could even open your mouth, you have to hold back all your own knowledge and find something so small that they can understand, that a child can understand. So yes, in a sense, the first act is an act of expression, but that expression in your mind, that expression actually followed. So for the child's perspective, <clears throat> what the ch child sees initially is an act of giving. But the reality is that within yourself, that act of giving can only follow an act of holding back. And holding back is, it's not about what I want to say. I want to say something else. I want to tell my child everything I know, but I have to hold that back respect the person's limitations, respect the person's capacity, and tailor my message to that person. That's an act of respect. It's not self-expansion. Thank you. Beautifully. Even Thank with you. the creation, if it, it, from God's perspective, there's going to be the symptom first. Okay. Okay. So just to give us, uh, just to give a, uh, now we're going to get to the love. And as I mentioned, Abish Ner Zaman is going to say that everybody has the love that they want Hashem they want the divine presence to connect with their soul. Then it's going to get into the concept that there's a broader love, which is I want to connect God with the collective Jewish souls, which is a beautiful thing the Kabbalah says you should have. It's not necessarily fully accessible immediately. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It, in some sense, it's true, but it's not the ultimate truth. So we'll, 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 we'll run through it. We'll see what happens. We'll see how much we can absorb. Uh, we have 15, 14 minutes left for the longest or maybe second to longest chapter. Um, so here we go. But like I said, they're not necessarily difficult to understand the concepts may be difficult to achieve but not so difficult to understand okay now we continue similarly now that we spent a half a chapter saying that awe that 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 love without awe is not good because love love without awe is only one wing we're going to say awe itself is not is, is only one wing because you need a relationship a relationship that, that i'm with in awe of you i have respect for you but i have no drive to become close to you that is also not a not a full relationship not a wholesome relationship so that's what he's saying now. Similarly, fear alone is but one wing, and one service cannot ascend with it on high, even though it is termed the service of a servant. So you can serve God, but it's not going to ascend. It's not going to bring you up. It's not going to bring you close, make you feel connected to God. And, and there must also be the service characteristic of a son, i.e. service motivated by love. How do you do that? In order to awaken at least the natural love for God that is hidden in one's heart so that he should at least become conscious of it in his mind. Talked about the natural love that every Jew has within his soul. Be conscious of the fact that your soul loves God. To recall his love of one God in his thought and his desire to cleave to him. This should be his intent when occupying himself with the Torah or with the particular commandment. That his divine soul as well as his vivifying soul, meaning the godly soul and the animal soul, together with their garments, shall cleave to him as has been explained above. In other words, before you study Torah, the first thing Rabbi Shneir Zalman said in the beginning of the chapter, think about the greatness of God and recognize the awe that you're going to accept his will. You're going to do what he wants. Now he says, before you're going to do a mitzvah, understand, why am I studying Torah? Why am I doing a mitzvah? Because I want to cleave to God. Because I want to become close to God. That is an act of love. You have that love within yourself, but you have to be conscious of it within your mind. Now we go and we say, well, now we're going to the concept, don't be so selfish. It's not about you want to connect to God. There's also the concept that when I study Torah, I connect God not only to me, but to the collective Jewish people. So that's, that's sort of a, a second point. 
We're going to say most people can have at least some of this. Let's continue. Yet, in fact, the sages of blessed memory have said that a man should never separate himself from the community. Meaning, I want to connect myself to God. I'm not an individual. I'm part of a community. Therefore, he should intend to unite and attach to him, blessed be he, the source of his divine soul. And in addition, the source of the souls of all Israel. What's the source of all of Israel? Kabbalistically speaking, Malchut of Atzilut, the lowest level of Atzilut, is the source of all Jewish of all, of all Israel. So if I'm bringing the divine light, when I do a mitzvah, I bring an increased flow of divine light, of infinite light upon myself, my soul, it first goes to the source of my soul. Then it comes down to my soul. The source of my soul is the same source of all souls. So in some sense, I'm bringing increased light to the collective Jewish people. And I should say, that should be my intent. Why am I doing it? Not just to connect myself to God, but to connect the source of the collective Jewish people to God. Therefore, you should intend to unite and attach to him, blessed to him, blessed be he, the source of his divine soul, and in addition, the source of the souls of all Israel. The source being the spirit of his mouth, called by the name Shekhinah, because it dwells, shochenet, and clothes itself in all worlds, animating them and giving them existence. And it is the Shekhinah, which imbues him with the power of speech to utter his current words of Torah, or with the power of action to perform the particular commandment at hand. In other words, when I'm doing a mitzvah, uh, where does my soul get energy from? From its source. What is its source? The shechina, the divine presence. So now when I bring the additional light to the divine presence, I am bringing additional light to the entire Jewish, to the, to the collective Jewish souls. This union, yichud is a very capitalistic word. This union is attained through drawing forth the light of the blessed Ein Sof here below by being occupied in the Torah and the commandments wherein the light of the Ein Sof is clothed. And he should be intent on drawing his blessed light over the source of the soul and the souls of all Israel as to unite them with him. This meaning of this union will be discussed at length, at length later on. Note here. This then is the meaning of the words we recite before performing various commandments. For the sake of the union of Kutcha Brichu, blessed one, the, the holy one, blessed be he, with, the, with his Shekhinah. And then we conclude in the name of all Israel. Before I do a mitzvah, I say, why am I doing this mitzvah? Because I want to connect the infinite light, Kaddish Baruch Hu, which is the infinite light, with Shechinta, which is the divine presence, the soul, source of all Israel. But I say, the shame call Yisrael in the name of all of Israel. Meaning it's not just my, I want to come close to God. But when I do a mitzvah, the collective souls of all Jews become close, close to God. Skipping the comment, too much Kabbalah. We continue. And although in order that this intent should be sincere in his heart, so that his heart should truly desire this higher union, his heart must harbor a great love for the God alone. In other words, the only way I would care about the collective Jewish people is if I love God and I want to do what God wants, and God wants that union. But the lower level of love, I don't really sense I'm doing what I, I want to become close to God. What God wants is less important to me in the lower level of love. He says to, to do what is gratifying to him alone and not to propose and not for the purpose of questioning his soul's thirst for God. In other words, if you really want to feel the desire to do a mitzvah for the sake of the collective Jewish people, you have to be in love with God to do what God wants, not to quench your own thirst. Why do I'm doing the mitzvah? Not because I want to quench my own thirst, my own longing to God. I want to feel close to God, but I want to do what God wants. And the metaphor is, but he must be like a son who strives for the sake of his father and mother, whom he loves more than his own body and soul, as explained above in chapter 10 from citing Rai Mahemna. Nevertheless, every person should habituate himself to this intent, for though it may not be in his heart in perfect and complete truth, so that he should long for it with all his heart. In other words, it's not, you're not going to get the level that this is you, you really want to connect uh, God with the, with the source of all souls to unite God with all of Israel. That is something that is hard to achieve unless you have a higher level of love. Nevertheless, to some small extent, his heart genuinely desires it because it is the inborn love in every Jewish heart to do whatever the supernal will of God. This union meaning the union of the source of all Jewish souls with the infinite Ein of light is his true desire, namely the supernal union in the world of Atzilut, which is produced by arousal from below through the divine soul union and absorption in God's light that is clothed in the Torah and the commandments in which it is engaged so that they become one in reality as is being explained above. For by reason of this, the source of Torah and the commandments, i.e. the Holy One, Blessed Behi, is united with the source of the individual divine soul, which is the Shekhinah. Expressed in terms of the different, different levels of supernal illumination, these are the categories of, fulfill, of fulfilling the worlds and encompassing the worlds, as is explained elsewhere at length. Okay. So he's saying, yes, you can have a little bit of the desire to unite God with all the souls. But the fact that I want to become close to God through a mitzvah, that is the, clearly the will of every Jew. And every Jew can arouse this will before he studies Torah, before he does a mitzvah. And the motivation, why am I doing the mitzvah? So the, when I think about the awe in the beginning of the chapter, I'm doing the mitzvah because this is God's will. Now I'm doing the mitzvah 
The second meditation is I'm doing it because I want to become close to God. I want to cleave to God. That will is inborn in every soul. But this union of the person's own soul with and its absorption into the light of God making them one, this is what every member of Israel desires in absolute and utter truth with all his heart and all his soul because of the natural love that is hidden in every Jewish heart to cleave to God and not under any circumstance to be parted or, 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 sunder, or sundered or separated, God forbid, from his blessed unity and oneness, even at the cost of his very life. Now, what does my soul want? My soul want to be, wants to be absorbed and go back to God. And therefore, I'm going to risk my life. I could even sacrifice my life, my, have my soul leave my body to come close to God. So Rabbi Shneur Zalman says that's, that's exactly what happens every time I study Torah or do a mitzvah or pray. Because in some sense, my soul is leaving my body. My soul is leaving the focus of the material needs and I'm focusing on my soul. So in some sense, every time I study Torah do a mitzvah, my soul is leaving my body and cleaving to God. Being engaged in Torah and the commandments and prayer is also a matter of actual surrender of the soul, just as when it leaves the body at the end of 70 years. For then it does not think of bodily needs, but its thought is united with and clothed in the letters of the Torah and prayer, which are the word of the th and thought of God, and they truly become one. In other words, what happens after my soul, my soul leaves the body? My, my soul no longer is worried about the needs of the body. When my soul leaves the body, it's in Ghana and studying Torah. It's not thinking about breakfast. Says Rabbi Shneir Zalman, when you're studying Torah, even, even when you're living on this earth, your soul also leaves your body in the sense that you're not thinking about your breakfast. You're thinking about the words of Torah. This is also the whole occupation of the souls in the Garden of Eden, as stated in the Gemara and the Zohar. Except that there, in the Garden of Eden, they delight in their app apprehension of and absorption into the light of God. Now we don't really understand. We don't really sense. We don't really feel the connection. But in heaven, the soul feels the connection. But the bottom line is, it's the same thing. When I study Torah, I am coming close to God. It's my soul's desire to leave the body and unite with God. The way I do that is study Torah and I'm fulfilling this much. This is, this is why it is ordained by the men of the Great Assembly, that when we recite at the beginning of the morning blessings before the prayers, my God, the soul which we, which, with which you have placed within me is pure. You have breathed it into me. You will eventually take it from me. Very strange blessing. I say, thank God for the soul. At the beginning, you say, my daddy, thank God for the soul. And then after that, there's another blessing, which is an elaboration of my daddy. It comes from the Talmud. And it says, God, the soul that you gave me, you blew it into me, etc., and you will eventually take it from me. What does that mean? It's morning. Why am I thinking about mortality and death? So as Rabbi Shneir Zalman, the meaning is as follows. That is to say, in as much as you breathe it into me, and you will eventually take it from me, I therefore, as of now, hand it over and return, and return it to you to unite it with, with your oneness. As it is written, to you, O Lord, I lift my soul. In other words, my soul is part of you. You gave it to me. You're also going to take it back. So you know what? While it's still within me, I'll also return it to you. I'll also connect it to you. I'll raise my soul to you. How? Through the study of Torah and doing a mitzvah when I'm absorbed in the divine will and I, my, my soul is not thinking about the needs of the body at that moment. That is through binding my thought with your thought and my speech with your speech by means of the letters of the Torah and prayer which I utter. Especially when I when I address God in the second person as in the phrase, blessed are you and the like. When I pray, I'm talking to God like, like, he, like he's in my presence. I'm connecting myself to him. With this preparedness to surrender his soul to God, one should begin to recite the morning benedictions, blessed are you, and so on. Similarly with this preparedness, one should also begin a regular course of study immediately after prayer. So also in the course of a day, before one begins to study, such preparation is at least necessary, as it is known that in the case of, of, of Benonim, the essential preparation and intent for its own sake, where, where it is indispensable is before the beginning of study. This is the same as in the case of writing a bill of divorce, the scroll of Torah, when we're for their, for their own sake is an indispens indispen indispensable requirement, and it is sufficient. If at the commencement of writing of a Torah scroll, the scribe says, I am now about to write the sacred purpose for the, for the sacred purpose of the scroll of the Torah, or in the case of the divorce, for him and for her, and so on. What is Rabbi Shneir Zalman is saying? Before I start studying Torah, I think about that I want to I'm studying Torah in order to connect my soul with God. And that's the love. That's, the, that's what motivates me to study. And that's considered a wing the other wing that will raise the Torah study and make my relationship with God wholesome. Then he gets into this whole thing which for its own sake. What Rabbi Shneur Zalman is saying is as follows. When I study Torah, I'm not necessarily thinking of my love to God or the desire to cleave to God. What am I thinking about? The law. Do people arguing about a dollar or a garment? This is mine. It's yours. We're thinking about the, the subject matter of the Torah. We're not thinking about cle cleaving to God. 
So Rabbi Shnei says it doesn't matter. Some people could be conscious of God even when they're studying the Talmud. But if you're not on that level, it's okay. Why? Because halakhically speaking, the intention is necessary in the beginning of the activity. He brings two examples. The law is if you're writing a Torah scroll, you have to write it for the holiness of a Torah scroll. It can't just be I'm writing it. You have to be write it for the holiness of a Torah scroll. If you write a bill of divorce, you can't just pick up a form and fill it out. You have to write the bill of divorce for the sake of this man and this woman. So the law is at the beginning of the activity, when I sit down to write the Torah scroll, or when I sit down to write down the bill of divorce, I say, I verbalize, I'm doing this for the mitzvah of writing the Torah scroll, or I'm doing, I'm writing the bill of divorce for this man and this woman. And then it's sufficient for the remainder of the time. So when I study Torah, it's the same thing. Before I start doing a mitzvah, or before I start studying the Torah, then I should think about the idea that I'm doing this because I want to become close to God. And that becomes the wing of love. Now we're going to continue. I'm going to say, what happens if I study for many hours consecutively? So what, because eight o'clock in the morning, I had this meditation. He says, Kabbalistically, stop every hour. Every hour, stop and have this meditation. Because every hour, there's a different energy in the world. So you need this meditation anew. So let's continue. And when he studies for a number of consecutive hours, he should reflect on the preparedness referred to above at least an, at, at hourly intervals. For in each hour, there is a different flow from the higher worlds to animate those who dwell here below, while flow of vitality from, the, from on high of the previous hour returns to its source in accordance with the esoteric principle of advancing and retreating, expounded in Sefer Yetzirah. And the soul, every hour, the light goes back with all the Torah that was studied at that moment, at that, during that hour. And that's why there's a new energy. You need a new meditation. Together with all the Torah and, and good deeds of those who dwell here below, for in each of the 12 hours of the day, there, there rules one of the 12 combinations of the letters that form the four-letter name of God, while the combinations of the letters they comprise, the divine name Adne, rule at night as it is known. So you have 24 hours, you have two names of God, Hashem and Adne, you each have four letters. Um, four letters, you have, 12, you have 12 combinations. Every hour of the day, there's combinations of the name Hashem. Every hour of the night, there's a different energy from the different combination of the name El, uh, um, Adonai. Look at Sefer Yitzira for more information. Now we're going to say, now, all one's intent in the surrender of his soul to God through Torah and prayer, to elevate the spark of godliness therein, in his soul back to its source, should, should be solely for the purpose of causing him gratification. In other words, I'm in love with you, but I'm doing it to you to make you, to please you. I want to come close to God. It's, it shouldn't be selfish love. It should be for, for the sake of God. Like the joy of a king, when his only son returns to him after having been released from captivity or imprisonment, as has been explained earlier in chapter 31. In other words, when I'm the son and I'm released from prison, I'm going to reunite with my father. I could say, I'm so happy I'm reuniting with, me, with my father. That's love, correct. Deeper level of love is, I'm so happy I'm reuniting with my father because it's going to make him happy. And if you're truly in love, you will sense his joy as well. And Bishnei Zalman is going to say, even that level, every person could achieve. That I'm studying Torah because I want to connect to God. Why do I want to connect to God? I'm the son who wants to connect to his father, but even more because I know that this will bring joy to my father. Now, this intent, solely to bring gratification to God by returning one's own soul to God, is genuine and truly and completely sincere in every Jewish soul at all times and every hour, a virtue of the natural love, with which is a heritage bequeathed to us by our ancestors. So it's natural in your heart, but you have to make time to think about it so it exists in your conscious mind. Nevertheless, one should not be satisfied merely with this level of service. One needs to establish set, set periods for reflecting on the greatness of God in order to attain intellectually generated fear and love. And with all that, perhaps one may succeed in attaining such fear and love, as has been stated previously, and we're going to talk about this later, that these are, this is the level of natural awe and love. And in the next later chapters, we're going to talk about creating and meditating and creating uh, uh, intellectual love and awe. To summarize, it's 1102, we did the second to longest chapter in Tanya, so congratulations. Uh, to summarize, what did we say? First of all, we said that you need two wings. And the two wings means you can't just serve God with the motivation of love alone. What is love? I want to become close to God. You also have to have the other wing, which is all, not just also, but the beginning, the begin with the foundation of everything has to be the service of God. I'm doing it for God's sake. And then we talked about the meditation. Think about how God is imminent, how God transcends. And nevertheless, he wants a relationship with me. And at a minimum, I get to the level where, like Rabbi Yechelen ben Zakkai says, I feel like God is here, like another person's here. I'm not going to go against God's will. Um, just like I wouldn't go against somebody else's will if they're standing right in front of me. Then we talked about the love, and we said love is 
stop and think every hour or before you do a mitzvah that you're doing this because you want to be drawn close. You want to draw your soul close to God. You want to have a yichu, the unity, the union of bringing the infinite light on your soul. And then we got into the idea, if you think about it, it's not just your soul, but it's all the collective souls of all Israel. A little bit, you, could, you can have a little bit of that desire as well. But the fact that you should become close to God is, is, is a given that every soul feels. You just have to, you, every soul has innately, you just have to think about it. And then we went to the next step, the deeper step. Why do I want to become close to God? Not only because I'm the son who wants to become close to his father, but also because I know that that will bring joy to my father. So in other words, we're doing it because this is God's will. And therefore the love itself is also becomes selfless. I want to draw close to you because I know this is what you want. So that's summary in short. Um, like I said, a lot to think about, but this is very foundational in the sense that we need both wings and we need the awe, but we also need the love. And when we do the mitzvah, we need to take a minute or two before the mitzvah to think about the fact that this, first of all, this is the desire, will of God, so we suspend our own will. But on the other hand, we, by doing this mitzvah, we're actually drawing ourselves closer to God, and that is the meaning of love. So thank you all. Um, sorry for the, for the increased pace. We had to finish uh, somewhere near on time. But thank you very much. Have a wonderful Shabbos. Go ahead, Vicky, please. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I had a I had a question about the last section that that we went over about the um the study of Torah. So it seems like uh, with the study of Torah, you are t you are trying to connect to God, but at the same time, you're you know that it gives pleasure to Hashem. So is it only specific to Torah or any other no, mitzvah? It's every mitzvah. The reason why we got carried away with Torah is because Torah, when I'm putting when I'm doing a mitzvah, when I'm eating the matzah, I could think about Hashem. When I'm studying Torah, I can't really think about Hashem. Why not? Because I'm think, studying Torah, I have to be thinking about the cow. I have to think about the, the, the legal argument. You can't study Torah if you're in awe of God. You have, when you study Torah, you have to think about the legal arguments. So how could you have two, two ideas in your head simultaneously? Well, maybe some people could have. Well, Rabbi Shneir Zalman says here, it's enough that in the beginning of the study of Torah, or at least every hour, stop and understand that I'm studying Torah because I want to become close to God. But the same is true for every mitzvah. Every mitzvah, he says also before you pray, before you say the blessings in the morning, every mitzvah is to be motivated by the idea. Stop for a second and, and, and get in touch with the desire of your soul, which is hidden within yourself, that you want to become close to God and let that idea sit within your conscious mind. Thank you. So basically it answers the question about what is primary, what is secondary, because here they merge in a way. Kind yeah, of. here here is the goal to yeah. You know, we, in other words, we, we we sort of moved away from that subject in the sense that that we solved the question of what which is primary. We said the action is primary, but the emotion is the wings. And now we're in the subject of emotion. So what we're going to try to do for the next ten chapters is create the emotion. And you're right, we're not talking about. I, 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 I meant I meant what is primary uh, fear oh, or love. Fear and so love. so if, if here here they kind of merge, especially in the study of Torah because it's so apparent. But any other mitzvah as well, kind of. I think that we're still getting at the point that one has to follow the other. We can't have two ideas in my head. And therefore, at the beginning of the day, I think about the awe. Then before I do a mitzvah, I think about the love. Right? That, that seem, that it, seems to be, it seems to be saying, yes, later we're going to get to the level of ben shu eved, a son who is a servant, meaning you could feel both simultaneously. He says, that's the higher level, that's the higher awe. We'll get to that later. But right now, it seems that a person cannot have two ideas in the whole, in, 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 at the same time. Even Maimonides, when Maimonides discusses the mitzvah of love and awe, he says, think about the greatness of God. And that will want, make, make you want to become closer. And right away, you're going to, and, and then after that, when you become close, you're going to sort of, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to be in awe. I think he says love first, but whatever. Yeah, I'm, I come close. When I come close, then I become in awe, right? When I'm distant, the awe is lessened. When I, the closer I become, the more the awe is present. My point is only to say, that it's very, it's um, at, at least at the starting points, you can't feel both hard to think about both simultaneously. So Rabbi Shneir Zalman says, the beginning of the day, you think about awe. And then he says, before you pray, not a few more minutes advanced, you already had that initial meditation. Then you think about the idea that why am I doing this? I go to show, I put on my tefillin. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I want to draw close to God. I want to unite with God. I want to have the yichud. Now, what type of yichud? So first of all, I want, to, I want my soul to be connected to God. Then he tried to stick in what the Kabbalists say, what the sages say. Don't just think about yourself. Think about the collective Jewish people. Okay, some people could do more of that, some people less. You want it, you don't want it. But the true desire 
But the fact that I want to become close to God, that's the truth. That's genuine that every single Jewish soul has. Question is, you have to give time to make let it, let it, let it linger in your conscious mind. And that would be the other wing. That would be the motivation of love. Thank you very much. So it's a pra practical um, kind of a manifestation of uh, uh, the action is primary for the for the creations. That's why you need to connect to to fear first, but then by doing it, but then you eventually you feel the love as well. Right. Both. You'll feel yeah. both as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Good job, Mr. Rabbi. Okay. Good job, everybody. Wonderful day. And um, see each other in good health, God willing. Oh my. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom, Karina. Take care. Be well.